Okay, this is going to be a rundown of psychological and really social science research methods. Uh, they're very similar to a lot of things that happen in regular science, but this, these research methods are the ones you should know for AP Psychology or for an intro to psych class. So, let's take a look. There's really two main different types here. There's correlational studies and there's experimental studies. Well, what does a correlation show? Well, a correlation is good for showing relationships between two different sets of data. By sets of data, I mean like lists of data. That could be two columns in an Excel spreadsheet. An experiment, though, is good for showing cause and effect. You know, one thing happens and it triggers this other thing. Um, correlational studies are good for making predictions. You know, if you have a correlation between smoking and lung cancer, you can predict with a good deal of likelihood that someone who smokes their whole life will probably get uh, lung cancer. Whereas an experiment is good for showing uh, that, that the one thing causes another, that there's cause and effect, um, that you can actually, with certainty, say that this one thing does cause another, not just that there's a high likelihood that these two things are related. Um, so correlations show relationships, where experiments show cause and effect. You want to remember the one big thing the one big point is that correlation is not causation. Just because two things are correlated does not mean that one thing causes the other, and we're going to get into that here. So the first things first, we're going to look at a correlation. Here is a correlation between gas prices over here and the average driving amount that a person does in a week. Now, I just made up these numbers for the sake of the class, but let's say that this is the case that a person on average will drive 300 miles per week if gas is 250-ish, and that they'll drive uh, about lots less, 100 miles per week if, when gas is 450. Uh, the correlation is the connection between that data and that data. There's a big connection there. This would be called a negative correlation. When one increases, when one set of data increases, that is, the increase in the gas prices, uh, the other set of data uh, decreases. So the higher one is, 450, the lower the other is, 100. Um, so a negative correlation. This, though, would be the opposite. This is another correlation. Let's say there's a correlation between the number of books that a person has read in their lifetime and how well they do on the SAT writing portion. So let's say if someone read 40 books in their lifetime, they would match up out here with somewhere around a perfect score. Who knows? May I made these up too. But this is sort of giving you the picture. This is called a positive correlation. That's when one set of data increases and the other set of data also increases. The more books you read, the better your score will be on the SAT writing section. The more, the better. The more, the more is a positive correlation. And the more, the less is a negative correlation. The less, the less would still be a positive correlation. Uh, one set of data going down while the other goes down is the same as one set of data going up as the other goes up, if you think about it. Um, so what are these correlations, though? Because a lot of students always ask, what is this line? What, how, how is it that you can directly predict that if someone read 20 books, they'll, uh, they'll get a 400 on the SAT? And I say, that's not exactly what we're doing here. These data, this data is descriptive. We're, we're using a line of best fit along a scatter plot. So the scatter plot are all these points. All of these points represent a person. So like, for example, you don't even have the line there. You don't even need, the line isn't real. The people are real. The line just represents those people. And like, what about this? This one thing is one person. Let's say it's this person, Jimbo Johnson. And Jimbo Johnson read 40 books and his SAT writing score is 650. Each of these others are also represented by a person. And they're also represented in a different way. Something like this, an, uh, an Excel spreadsheet where, where there's two columns, books read, here's Jimbo Johnson, 40 books read, SAT writing 650, there he is. Any data like this, where you have two columns in an Excel spreadsheet can be put into correlational format. Um, you can see if any two sets of data are correlated. Well, backing off here, here's Jimbo Johnson again. 
and there he is, and see how he fits into a line. And it makes a lot more sense just to say, okay, there's this line here. We have this one uh, line of best fit that represents the thing. And really, it has a certain slope. It has a positive slope if it's a positive correlation, and a negative slope if it's a negative correlation. It will always look that way if it's, if that's the case. But there's some that there's no correlation at all. It's just a scatter plot of nothing. Here's, a, here's something, two sets of data where there would be no correlation between the two. We have the price of gas on the day the SAT was taken and the SAT writing score. That would make any sense. You know, at one point, a person, the price of gas is three bucks and their SAT writing score is 600. There's no correlation, no rhyme or reason between these two sets of data, and that's why the graph looks like this. It's a mess. No correlation at all. Well, now we're going to take it up a notch, and we're going to talk about a thing called a correlation coefficient. This would very appropriately have a correlation coefficient of zero, because there's no correlation there. there these two sets of data are not related in any way. But other things actually have a correlation, and uh, a, a positive or negative correlation. We're going to go over that kind of stuff right now. So, in terms of correlation coefficients, they can't be more than one, and they can't be less than negative one. So all correlation coefficients would fall within this spectrum of one to negative one. You would very rarely, though, have a correlational coefficient of one. That would be nearly impossible. That would be an absolute direct correlation. We'll get into a little more of that here in a second. But a positive correlation would be up here in the positive range between zero and one. A correlation of zero would, no correlation, something like a graph that looks like that would fall right in the middle. And a negative correlation, of course, would fall down here in the negative range. Never, though, would it be greater than one or, or less than negative one. Absolute value of one is the, the highest it can be. Um, so correlational coefficients, if they're positive between zero and one, if, they're, if there's no correlation, zero, if they're negative, it's in zero and one. But, like I said, these cases are very rare. Rarely will there be a correlational coefficient of one. Very rarely will be exactly zero. In the real world, numbers look more like this. Correlational coefficients that are positive would be something like 0.8. That would be a very high correlation coefficient for a positive correlation. Uh, anywhere between like negative 0.3 and 0 0.3 uh, would be no correlation. Uh, a scientist wouldn't be very happy if he, if, you know, if he was trying to find a correlation between something and he got like 0.2 as the correlation. That still counts as no correlation. And then a negative correlation would be something like negative 0.72. Um, these are, are numbers in the real world. Let me show you what it looks like on the scatter plot. Let's say that uh, I wanted to find whether there's a connection between how much ginger ale a person takes in in a year, drinks, and how many jokes uh, they tell that people laugh at. I'm a big ginger ale drinker, so maybe I want to know whether there's, well, there's a correlation between how funny you are. So we would measure somehow the percentage of jokes that a person tells that they laughed at. We would count up all the jokes and the jokes that they laughed at. And then we would take in how many cans of ginger ale they drink in a year. Well, if it was zero correlation, it would look like this. A massive, the night sky, basically, of, of stars. Of each of these is a person, and let's say this one person uh, drinks no ginger ale and gets no jokes laughed at. But then this other person, no ginger ale, lots of, lots of jokes laughed at. No correlation. But let's just say, hypothetically, that I found uh, a correlation, or started to, here would be a correlation 0.25, still not really that, but you see how the, the, the dots shrunk? They start to align a little more. What if it started to become more like 0.4? It would look like that. Or 0.6, it would continue to scrunch in, 0.65. Or 0.9. If we had this as our correlation coefficient, it would be very clear that that is a plot. It would almost follow an exact line. It would look very good. Um, that's how the data would end up looking. Correlational studies are great for showing connections between two things, or for showing relationships between two sets of different data. Um, but they're not great for showing causation. Warning, correlations do not show a causal relationship. 
causal, meaning one thing causes the other. Uh, I couldn't say uh, back here that ginger ale drinking causes. Where's it at? I couldn't say that drinking ginger ale causes you to be funnier, even though there's this connection that I've found between the two. If I wanted to say that, that drinking ginger ale causes uh, being funny, I would need to put it to a scientific test, to an experiment. A correlation is not an experiment. It's a different type of research altogether. So this is a correlation, but if I wanted to make an experiment, this is what I could do to test that out. I would start off with two different groups. One group would be drinking ginger ale. The other group wouldn't be drinking ginger ale. And the two groups, I would have to make sure that it's randomly selected. Students always ask, hey, well, what if this guy's the funniest guy in the world, and you put him in that group? Well, I would say, well, it's randomly selected, and we'd split them up. The independent variable is the thing that is different between the two groups. Whether or not the participants are drinking ginger ale is the independent variable here. Uh, once again, though, we need to make sure that our group size, or that our groups are, uh, can we hit stop? You just keep going. I messed up. I can cut it out. Okay, where I said group size. Uh, where I said we need to make sure. I'll start with we need to make sure. Okay. We need to make sure that our sizes of groups are good, though, too. Because what if that one person is in one group? You only have six people. Are you actually saying something here about humanity? Are you able to generalize these results? Not with six people, but with thousands of people, you would be able to generalize the results. You would take 10,000 people, and let's say you would randomly select 5,000 for that group and 5,000 for this group. The difference here being these are drinking ginger ale, these aren't. Then we would somehow put them in a comedic, a funny situation. Maybe we would give them some stand-up comedy club to play in. And we would make sure that this group, the audience, is just a randomly selected, massively large group. And we would put the ginger ale drinkers, the ginger ale drinkers, and the non-ginger ale drinkers, uh, both up on stage, and we would measure how much laughter is happening. Maybe we would have some sort of device, like a laugh meter A microphone would record, and we would have some threshold where if it breaks it, the person got their joke laughed at. This person's really having a good time. Um, so we've got the experimental group, the control group, and the laugh meter Our dependent variable, dependent variable, is the laugh meter being triggered at least 50% of the time for jokes. So the dependent variable is what you're measuring. The independent variable is the thing that is different. It's the thing you're trying to show that that causes something. That drinking ginger ale causes you to be funny would be the, the gist of this. So there's independent and dependent variable, and that's how you would cause it. Now my prediction for this I know that there's not a correlation between these two things, uh, so I don't think this would actually happen. This is just a hypothetical, meaning I made it up. But also, another way to collect data is to just use one set of data and collect the number of people that, for which that is true. Uh, that kind of thing is done on a frequency distribution or a histogram. Here's an example of a frequency distribution of people's walking speeds. Uh, over here we have the number of people, and down here we have the speed. Let's say I set up some camera in the hallway, or in a mall, or in a public place, and we measure how fast people are walking, and we say, okay, that, there's one person that walks 3.5 miles per hour, there's another that walks 3, and then we added those people up. Let's say I had measured that 500 people walked by that were going 3.5 miles an hour, but only 100 walked by that were going 1 mile an hour, and let's say 200 walked by that were going, what is that, 6.5 miles an hour, um, this would be how we would fill in that frequency distribution. And this is a frequency distribution that's beautiful. It's symmetrical on both sides. It's a normal distribution, also called the bell curve. It's the way that a lot of data ends up being. If you get an average, the mean being right down the middle, 3.5, really you got some people that deviate from the average, that are, are different from the average. So that is called standard deviation, uh, when people are spread out more. Here is a curve that's way more spread out. It would have a higher standard deviation. This one would have a very low standard deviation. It's packed in. 
there's very few uh, people that are that far from the mean, mean being the average right there. Uh, they're, they're most people are right in there. Uh, here's how it really goes. Very low standard deviation. The normal distribution would look scrunched together. Regular amount, it's a bell curve. Very high standard deviation would be like this, a uh, big wide curve, or else it would look like this, a U curve. A U curve is horribly uh, deviated. Let's say someone gave a test and everyone either got 100% or way down here in the 10, 20%. That's very spread. Very few people got in the middle. The mean would still be in the middle. And deviation, we're talking about deviation from the mean. So uh, the mean would be somewhere around 60, but no one really scored that. Everyone either passed the flying colors or failed. On the other hand, here's something called an S curve, where the scores are skewed. This is called skewed, way up. Most people got 100. Some very easy classes are like this, where it'd be hard to fail a class. But let's get back to the bell curve, the normal distribution, the one that looks pretty and, I don't know, it doesn't look too pretty. But, uh, let's say that this bell curve that we've got, the mean, let's say the mean is rated right about 3. It is. So I'm just making this up, but we'll see. Uh, and let's say that one standard deviation up, that's right, standard deviation isn't just a concept, it's a number. Uh, let's say that one standard deviation away from the mean is 4.5, which means that one standard deviation is 1.5. Uh, this class doesn't teach you how to calculate standard deviation. That's for statistics and math classes. You'll normally be given the standard deviation. But let's say it's 1.5 above. It could be, who knows, 1.8. In, it's a different number. It's not always 1.5. You should know that. But a standard deviation of 1.5. There is a rule that you should remember. The golden rule of this is that 68% of all scores, and in our case that means people, uh, will be within one standard deviation of the mean, meaning within this space, 68%. That's right in here. That's this much, 68%. Sometimes statisticians and scientists are asked, how much is here? Well, that's what we'll see in the next one. It'll be 34%. We just take 68 divided by 2. Sometimes people are asked even, how much is here? How much is outside of the bounds of it on one side? Well, you would just take the entirety of it, subtract 68, be left with the wings, each wing is 32%. And then divide that by 2. It's pretty easy to get through problems like that. You might see questions like that in tests. Um, well, who uses normal distributions? Well, let's say that we took that jokes and ginger ale study and we busted it up in a standard deep into normal distribution. Here would be our total results, but then we would separate out the control group from the experimental group, and we would see a big difference between the control and experimental group. This is how you can show causation. When you see that one group is clearly different, the mean is different, the whole thing is different. So there's the big difference between correlation and causation. Um, and that's that.